Is the microphone working? It is, sort of, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for having me. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about, and hopefully we'll get some interaction going about identity, growth, and change from a developmental science perspective. So first I wanna start by showing you a big picture of your brain and to say that who we are, who you are, who I am is completely in flux. We're changing and that identity can be looked at as a developmental construct. So when I say that, when I say that we're in flux, I mean that to define development as change over time. So we're always changing. And we're not just changing in ways, in superficial ways that we tend to think of, but our actual physical selves are changing. If you hold out your right hand for a second, and take a look at it. This hand has been with you for a while. This hand's been with you for a number of years. Take a look at the front and back. If we looked at your, at your hand when you were a year old, would you have recognized this, this same hand? Is this that same hand that you had when you were a baby, when you were a, a newborn, a one-year-old, a five-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 15-year-old? This is not the same hand, and it's not just the, uh, the same cells that have grown. Actually, every single cell in your body is replaced at, at a rate um, that's much faster than you sometimes think. So for instance, um, you know, in the state of constant change we're in, the cells in the lining of your stomach are completely replaced within five days. So every five days, the lining of your stomach is a completely different lining of the stomach. Your red blood cells every 120 days are completely replaced. Your liver takes about a year to be an entirely different organ. Um, the, your epidermis, your skin, every two weeks, you've got a new set of skin on your entire body. And your bones and your skeleton by 10 years have been completely replaced. So the, the actual physical self is changing as we operate, but also our brains are changing hourly and daily as we're using our brain. So there's this common myth that, that you may have heard is we only use a small percentage of our brain. We only use 5% of our brain. Has anyone ever heard that said? Raise your hand if you've heard that. So neuroscientists around the world are trying to figure out how this rumor got started that we only use a percentage of our brain. My hunch is that this got started because we're not aware of the processes. We're maybe aware of a small percentage of what we're doing with our brains, but we know from neuroscience that we use every part of our brain always. And the reason we know that is because any part that we're not using is reorganized immediately. Everything you do is reflected in your brain. So our neurons are making connections and they're wiring and rewiring as we're using them. So I want to ask you to do something right now. I want to take, ask you to put your left foot in the air, okay? And I want you to turn it clockwise, the way the clock is going, all right? Turn your left foot clockwise. Now I want you to take your left hand. Has everyone got their clockwise thing going? Right? Now at the same time, take your left hand and make a number six. Anybody got it? Can you do it? Keep trying. Okay, if you, if you continue to do this, for an hour a day, within a week, your brain will reorganize to the extent that you are able to complete this task. So right now, those pathways are not connected, but those pathways are not hard to connect. And just in the same way that, that your thoughts, the way you're organizing your mind, the way you're thinking about things, the way you're learning things in school, doing things differently, your brain and its wiring is completely changing. So in a developmental science perspective, we're, we're talking about things, we're interested in the process of change, but we're not gonna privilege any level of analysis. We're not gonna say if we look at your brain, that's where we really see development. Or if we look at your social situation with your roommates, that's where we're really gonna see your development. All these levels of who you are are constantly interacting, and not, not one of those levels is more important than any other. So this is a, a big diagram that shows a developmental system, and it's probably a little tricky to see, but you can see in here um, the child and the parent Actually, maybe we could hit the lights for just a second because this would be a, a good one to just check out quickly. If you look at, well, you can't even see it on there, can you? The different, the different effects that are, that are happening. So we have the biology of the person, we have the social situations, we have a school network, a marriage network, a work network, your community, your society, your culture, the child's interacting with people at school and interacting loosely with people at the parent's work, how the parent's being affected. These things are all impacting the development of the child and the development of the adult. Okay, we can turn the lights back on, sorry. 
And the other interesting thing about development is that because there's so many things operating at the same time when you're developing, we don't always know what's causing what. New behaviors and skills in children, in college students, in grown-ups appear, emerge in nonlinear ways. We can't predict. We can't predict that all of a sudden um, learning language has been a specialty of mine that I've studied in, in infants and children. And in learning language, there's this, there's this language miracle that we talk about. There's this thing that happens that's not well understood where suddenly children are making sounds and they're, they sound sort of like that. It's like, ba, does that mean ball? Is that a ball? How do we know, how do we know what to count as what? When then suddenly it seems like the child has been talking all along. It's very, very hard to record someone learning their native language. I've even tried it with my own children, and you feel like, okay, was that, is that what they meant? It was half a sound, does that count, and how do you record? But suddenly, they're speaking and talking, and every child in every culture around the world learns their native language by, say, two and a half or three, no matter how complex the grammar is, no matter how many things they have to learn. It doesn't matter if your parents are um, super smart or if your parents have had no education at all. It doesn't matter if you're from a wealthy family or if you're from an impoverished family. All kids get it. They get language, except kids you know, that, that have actual language disabilities, you will get your native language. And so we, we look at something like language as a complex skill. Actually, we could argue it's the most complex skill you've ever learned and will ever learn in your entire life. Um, it's gained effortlessly and unconsciously. And kids learn things all the time without trying to, and so do you. And so you're constantly learning. Learning is not just something that's, that's happening in the classroom. <laughs> Another important thing about developmental science is we're not just looking at um, you yourself, but we're looking at you within the structure of the environment. So you coming to college for the first time, there are all these layers to you, but there's also this structured environment that we can count on. And the best way I can explain that in, is, again, a language development analogy. If you look at a, a baby that's coming into the world trying to learn their native language, yes, they need to have a functional auditory system. We need to know that if they're going to learn a, an oral language, that they have to be able to hear that language and listen carefully, and their auditory system has to be functioning. We can count on that that the language learner is going to have that. But we can also count on the fact that the way we're going to talk to babies is going to be just as structured. If a baby walked in that room, if a baby came in, what do you think would happen? What would people say if a baby walked into the room? What would it sound like? Actually, if a baby walked in the hallway, we wouldn't even need to know. No one would have to tell us that there is a baby in the hallway. We could tell. How would we know? It, the way people talk, right? They would say, hi. All of a sudden, the pitch goes through the roof. All of a sudden, everything's stretched out. How are you? It's long, elongated. There's a reason people do that, and people all over the world do that. They talk to babies that way. And even little children talk to babies that way. They raise their pitch even higher and say hi and do big, expressive, emotional tones. And the reason that people do that, well, there's an actual function to that. That helps someone who's trying to understand sounds to make a discrimination. If you're trying to tell the difference between ball and doll, and it's very stretched out instead of ball, doll, that's hard. Ball, doll, it really helps the baby to make those distinctions. The other thing is the cochlea of a little baby's ear hears high-pitched sounds better than it hears low-pitched sounds, because it's a teeny little cochlea. And so raising our pitch actually helps them hear what we need to hear. So we can't just say, oh, people, are, people learn language because it's genetic that they learn language. They're just set up that way. We can't say that because we also know that the structure of your context is actually impacting you. And I would argue that it's impacting all of us in, in very important ways. So I want to talk a little bit about how do we know what's going on in your mind and your brain. And in the last 15 years, there have been amazing um, new discoveries in technology to study the brain. This is a picture of fMRI, which is a functional MRI. What this does is this measures the blood flow in your brain. When you're using a certain part of your brain, your, that area is going to consume more oxygen. And then it's going to have a more increased demand for blood flow. So more blood is going to flow into that part of the brain. So what an fMRI can do is show us what parts of the brain we're using and due to this technology we've been able to understand things that we've you know that we never thought before it was previously thought up until about 15 years ago that most of the brain development in your life happens at the beginning of your life 
Now we know, recent studies have shown that it's not till your 20s and even 30s that your brain is finished developing. So the trajectory of adulthood is, is very different. And people are saying, oh, the, the rental car companies have known this all along. They haven't let you rent a car until you're 25. Actually, there are discussions going on of whether, you know, what is, what is adulthood and, and new, new forms of adulthood, emerging adulthood is a kind of a catchphrase right now for people whose brains are still developing such as yourselves, and the part of the brain that's developing the most right now at your age is the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is right here in the front of your head. It's the most um, advanced, the most um, bigger, it's the biggest in humans as, a peer, as opposed to any other species. It's where you do a lot of your higher level cognitive functioning. So the things that you're being asked to do in this class, critical thinking, decision making, those kinds of things are happening in your prefrontal cortex, which is still developing, right? So if you wanna plan something or stop yourself from doing something inappropriate or rude or um, you know, sit in a lecture hall for an hour and listen to somebody or understand others, your sense of self-awareness, all those things are still evolving in you and growing. And so that's important for us to know what's going on with our brains. See, I'm losing my cursor here. So I want to talk about some ways we grow, change, and learn and become who we are. One of the ways we do that all the way from birth right up through college and adulthood is we perceive things we take in from the world around us and we wonder about things. That's the first one I want to talk about. Um, and in terms of little kids, I want to tell you a little bit about some studies that have shown this stuff. So here's a study where teachers were encouraging little kids to explore, to be curious in the classroom. And in this study, there, well, there were a couple of studies, but in one, the first study, two groups of eight and nine-year-old children were brought into the lab, and they were going to work on a teacher, with a teacher on a project called the Bouncing Raisin Project. So they were working with a, a science teacher, but the science teacher was really working with the experimenters, right? And then in group one, the teacher did this bouncing raisin project, which is putting raisins in and mixing um, vinegar with baking soda, and then the raisins start dancing around and jumping around. And the first group, the teacher left the room and said, I wonder what would happen if we put something else in the jar with the raisins, instead of the raisins. I wonder what would happen if we put paper clips or Skittles in there. And then she said that, and then she left the room. The second group, the second group, the teacher just said to the kids before she left, you can do whatever you want, and I'm going to go. And then they looked at the kids. What did they do? What do you think the kids whose teacher proposed something curious, what do you think they did? Anyone have a guess? They tried it. They felt that they had permission to be curious. They not only tried skills and raisins, they tried anything they could find in that, in that little mixture to see if it would bounce around. But the teachers who just said, do whatever you want, those kids just you know, maybe sat there and, and doodled. They didn't show the same responses. Now, the, cur the curiosity group, the group that was invited into curiosity, was more than twice as likely to try something new. So in the second study, what they did is they had a student, they had the child working with the experimenter. And the teachers that came in were being tested. And in this case, they had the child say to the teacher, um, well, uh, somebody left the room, somebody, the experimenter said, please help this student um, learn more about science. And then they said, have fun learning about science. And the second group, they said, please help the student fill out a worksheet. Have fun filling out the worksheet with them. And the, the, the teachers that were given permission to have fun and learn about science with the kids, as soon as the experimenter left the room, they were more than twice as likely to, to, to explore as a teacher. So it just goes to show that if we accentuate the role of curiosity, if we allow curiosity in our lives and in our classrooms, then, then a lot of learning can happen. They also, exploration can also propel learning via play and via experimenting with, with ideas. So in this, in this study, kids that were allowed to play with materials were more likely to solve a problem than kids that weren't allowed to play with materials. I don't know about you, but I remember being in science class when I was in school and we weren't allowed to touch the equipment at all until it was time to do the official experiment. So they would get out the microscopes and 
the slides and we were dying to get our hands on it, but by the time we were allowed to touch it, we weren't really interested anymore because it was so scripted what you could do with it. What we wanted to do was take it apart, mess around and play with it and actually get in there and actually learn something from that. These studies came from studies with chimpanzees, incidentally. The original research, they had something inside a jar and you had to reach in and retrieve it using the tools you were given. And in some cases, they just give you the tools, and it's the same with the kids. So they just give you a bunch of stuff, and there's a hole in a jar, and you have to try to get, get what's in the jar. But the group that was just given the stuff and tried to solve the problem couldn't solve the problem. But the group that was allowed to play with the stuff first, here's a bunch of materials, take 20 minutes and do whatever you want with these materials. Then when it came time to solve the problem, they could solve the problem. They were able to do, even in another example, they actually told the kids what to do to solve the problem. They actually said, okay, there's a toy stuck in this little hole. In order to do it, you're gonna have to fashion a, a tool that has something sticky on the end. Here's the sticky stuff, here's the straws. You have to connect the straws and reach in. And even those kids were less likely to solve the problem when they were given exact instructions than the kids that just had a chance to play. Something powerful about being playful that has to do with our, our growing and our learning and our developing. The same is true um, for questioning. And you probably have been asked in this course and this program to develop questions and to ask questions and to have discussion. There's something really important about developing your own questions. First of all, we find that at the time you're learning the most in your life, in that, in that young childhood period, Children ask so many questions. In this first study up top, three-year-old girls were wired with tape recorders. So they had them, um, you know, all day they listened to them and they counted how many questions those little girls asked. They asked 26 questions per hour. I can tell you I have a three-year-old girl and I can tell you that most of my day is spent fielding, fielding questions of, of huge magnitude, philosophy questions and questions of tiny, tiny scope. In this uh, updated study in 2007, they, asked, they found that preschoolers asked 76 questions per hour. But in the follow-up, when they went into a kindergarten classroom, they found only two to five questions asked, as opposed to 76. So what happened? What happened in that structure where they went from asking so many questions to, to simply following, to simply following directions. Only zero to two per stretch for fifth graders and two to five per two hour stretch for kindergartners. That should make us very sad. And when we think about ourselves, when we think about being in higher education, or think about in college, the absence of curiosity actually halts learning and growing. Not being curious anymore, not asking those questions anymore, that will stop your learning. And we have evidence from the brain. So for learning to become memory, for something that you learn to become a memory, it has to go through your emotional filter, and that's the amygdala. That's that red part. It's deep inside your brain. That's your part of your limbic system, the amygdala, and it's going to determine fight or flight, right? That's where you go. That's where your deep emotions are. That's when you're afraid and you know it's time to get out or you're going to or you're going to stand up and fight. It's more linked to survival. Right? And so it goes through there on the way to that prefrontal cortex that I mentioned. That's the seat of your critical thinking, your analysis, your executive function of your brain. So high stress, as soon as you feel stressed, you flip. You flip from the prefrontal cortex back to the amygdala. There's no reason to go up to the prefrontal cortex if you're in a stressful situation. So if you're stressed in school, then there is no way that you're gonna be able to access your critical thinking skills. So what do you think is the number one cause of stress in students, college students? Homework. Homework? Good guess. Any other? What else stresses you out? Besides homework? Tests? Exams stress you out? Papers? Writing? Public speaking? Does that stress anybody out? Yeah. The number one cause of stress, as reported by high school and college students, boredom. Being bored is very stressful for you. As soon as you become bored, you downshift into the amygdala mode. You can no longer use your critical thinking facilities anymore. What you do is you go into that fight or flight mode. You know that feeling when you're, you're just bored to tears? You gotta do something else, you gotta disengage, you gotta get out of there. You've got to start you know, texting your friend. You cannot use 
that kind of executive control, that kind of higher order thinking when you're feeling stress. So this is a problem for <coughs> passive learning. I want to go on to some other, another way that we tend to learn and grow and something we know about development is that we respond to new things in our world and we try new things. All the way through life, we're all set up to respond to everything that we are perceiving and to try it. There have been some really interesting studies on this. Um, kind of one of the, this is a snake, so I don't know if you can see that, but one of the classic um, discoveries of the, what I'm calling the novelty response, so that's the tendency of all animals to respond to something new in their environment, is for survival, right? If something's going to be coming into your environment that's new, you need to orient to it to know whether it's, is it going to attack you, is it going to get you? Um, the German zoologist Alfred Brehm in the 1860s did a really interesting experiment. He brought a box of snakes into a cage that was filled with chimpanzees, and chimpanzees are deathly afraid of snakes. And so this is their species typical response, and the box had a cover on it, and it was in there. Well, chimpanzees, just like humans, can't resist peeking in and checking things out. That's what we do. That's how we learn. We check things out. So they went over and lifted the lid. And they were scared to death when they lifted the lid. They, you know, despite it, they just, they had to get away. They were freaking out. They were making all kinds of noise. They were escaping the snakes. They put the lid back on. And then what they did is they went back and they checked it out again. They couldn't resist. Even though it scared them to death, they had to peek in again, and again, and again, and again. When this study was published, the person who was most interested in it was Charles Darwin, and he actually redid the experiment and found the same results. We are drawn to novelty, and across species, um, we show a preference for novelty as opposed to something that's been the same. We like new things. We like things that are exciting, and that's because they help us learn, and they help us grow. Um, willingness to try new things is one of the most important ways that we grow. And young children are all set up to try new things. Here's what they do. They overestimate their ability at how they're going to be at doing something. So if you ask a group of three and four-year-olds, you know, if you do a beanbag toss, if I set up a bucket over there and I start doing a beanbag toss, and I ask a group of three-year-olds, you know, do you... Do you think you're going to be able to do this? How many are you going to get in? And they'll say, well, I think I'm going to get all of them in. I think I can, I can do that. I can do that, that game. And if you show them juggling and you ask, do you think you can do that? Can you do it? Yeah, they can do it. They'll say they can do it. They'll estimate. Children oh, way overestimate what they think they'll get, how many balls they'll be able to juggle, how, how many beanbags they're going to get in. And those of us who have seen things like that look easy, like skiing or surfing or you know, and it looks easy until you get out there, and then you realize that this is, it's so different when you actually try it. But what they found in this series of studies, and this is just one of, of many, is that the kids, the kindergarten, first, and third grade children, um, they were giving a recall test. So it was a test of their memory. And they said, here are some things that you're going to be asked to remember. It's going to be a, a series of pictures I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to ask you to tell, tell me how many pictures you remember. And you, how many do you think you'll remember? So. They show them 20 pictures, and the, and the youngest kids say, I'm going to remember all of them. They, they have this idea that they're going to be great at it. The ones that overestimated the most actually did the best on subsequent tests. So the ones that way overestimated, say they said they remember 20, but they only remember three things, next time they gained so much more than the others. So the willingness to try actually helped them out in, in learning. And that has that shows across the ages. Now, something we know of that squashes um, that kind of trying and learning is surveillance. Surveillance. So being watched. And these are sort of classic studies. These are from the 70s. And it's really amazing that things haven't changed because we've known this for a long, long time, right? In the first study, they had children doing magic marker drawings. And it was kind of an after-school program. They have these big pieces of butcher paper, and you get magic markers, and you can draw. When they set a time limit on it, like you have five minutes to draw, then that completely squashed their motivation. The children quickly lost interest as soon as there's a time frame on what they're doing because they're, they were limited. That's, that's that first study, the externally imposed deadlines. And how much are you interested later? So they had a deadline the first day, the next day. Here's magic markers, and here's butcher paper. Who wants to do it? Nobody's interested. In the second study, what they did is they gave children positive feedback. What they said is they, wow, you did great. They give them all kinds of rewards. 
here, here, do this. Oh, wow, I see you're doing that. I see you're adding this. And wow, you're so smart. You're doing so well. You're so smart. You're doing so well. And then do you want to do that again? Nope, not interested. Because the surveillance, the act of being observed, just came in, in direct conflict with their natural motivation, their idea of what they wanted to do. Is it coming from them or intrinsic motivation? The, um, the graphic novelist Linda Berry writes about this phenomenon in her book. And she's, she does these amazing, if you haven't seen her work, you should check it out. But she does these amazing um, comic book spreads. And some of them are very metacognitive. So she shares her experience of growing and learning with, with her audience. And so she says, this is called Two Questions. These, she says, I'm not sure when these two questions became the only two questions about my work, or when making pictures and stories turned into something I called my work. I just knew I stopped enjoying it, and instead began to dread it. And the two questions that plagued her throughout her career are, is this good or does this suck? Is this good or does this suck? Is this good or does this suck? That is that internalized surveillance, constantly being judged on what you're doing, can squash the creative process, can squash learning, and can actually squash your development. And so she talks about when she was a kid, before those questions happened. It used to be that the lines made a picture and the picture made a story. I wasn't the only kid it happened to. Every kid I knew could do it. Everybody came up with these things. They were, they were not being um, assessed. And so she's showing herself making these amazing things. It's a, you know, it's Dracula. Hey, look out. What's that smell? <laughs> and, you know, and so these, these kinds of opportunities for freedom are very important for growth. And that brings me to this research that's kind of been highly publicized lately, and especially for kids, but actually there have been some recent studies also in higher education and on adults. And this is about a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. Has anyone heard about this? Yeah, a little bit? Okay, so here's what they did. What they were looking at is, in this study, is just praising the kids for intelligence. Just saying, you are so smart. They had them doing, um, this was fifth graders, they were working on problem sets. So they were doing pretty hard problems, math problems and word problems. And in, in one group of kids, they just said, wow, you got, you got five correct. You must be really smart. The second group, they said, wow, you got five correct. You must have worked really hard on that. There's a very subtle distinction between the, fi the fixed mindset is the idea that I did well because I'm smart. Something in me, I'm smart. The growth mindset, I did well because I worked really hard. And then they had them go back to the task. The, the group that was praised for being intelligent displayed less persistence. They, were, they gave up way faster than the other group. They enjoyed the task way less. And they had worse performance on future tasks because they felt though as though they were smart. The kids who were praised for working hard it didn't matter. It didn't matter how well they did. They persisted, which we all know, just like the kids that have confidence, that means they're going to try more. And these, these kids tried more because they know that hard work is how they got to where they got to. And so trying more led them to more success. So we also see this in, in higher ed. Um, if you give adults the choice to go back and do something they've already done well at, or something that they haven't done well at. And then you test them for whether they have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset about themselves. The ones with a growth mindset are much more likely to go back and try again after they've made mistakes. They're much more, they report again, much more enjoyment from the process. And they're not so concerned with looking smart all the time if they have a growth mindset. So they're willing to try new things. They're willing to take intellectual risks. And risk taking is one of the most important things about development. So it's, it's the kind of thing we've already been talking about. Struggling and making mistakes propel learning and growing. So making mistakes is one of the most important things you can do this year as a freshman in college. That's one of the most important things you can do if you want to learn the most. Our cognitive muscles gain from struggling. Struggling, and it's just the same that your physical muscles are affected in the gym. When you lift weights, you are actually damaging your muscles, and then those muscles are rebuilding tissue and they're becoming even more stronger. When you're making the kinds of mistakes that, that derail you, you get on entirely different paths 
And that's the way that you can maximize how you grow. There have been studies all over. I picked a few um, just to tell you about one in the University of Sheffield, England. Um, there's an online learning game called Axon. Um, the, the students the, who did the least well at the beginning were the ones, so they made more mistakes at the beginning. When they looked later at mastery of the game, they were the students that had mastered the game the most, the ones that had more mistakes early on. At UCLA, um, some researchers have found that students that make an un unsuccessful attempt at remembering information remember the information better later on. So first time they had a negative response, they didn't get it right, they remember the information later. And in the last study um, at Michigan State, they looked at adults, college students with fixed versus growth mindsets, and they hooked up an EEG scanner. So they looked at the electrical um, potentials in their brain. They actually looked at their brain function. And the growth mindset group made errors, but they were more likely to recover quickly. And they showed enhanced brain activity in the, in the EEG areas. So this is not just something we're seeing in performance, but also something we're seeing on affecting brains. And the last thing I want to talk about, things that help us grow and learn in a developmental science perspective, is that one thing we do is we situate ourselves in social contexts. We, we join in socially, and that tells us a lot about um, emotional responses, how to behave, what to do. You've all just come to college, and the rules are different in college, right? The way you live when you're not living with your parents, the way you live in a dorm, the way you do things on campus, you have to sort of learn the, the culture of college. Well, we're incredibly adept at learning social things. I wanted to show you this picture. This is a Liverpool soccer, and this guy just made a big mistake, and everybody in the audience is doing the exact same thing with their, with their hands. Did these guys plan this? <laughs> no. This is something, this is an incredible skill, and that is the skill to know socially to create a reality together and to understand you know, complex emotions and feelings together and share that information with one another. We understand and interact with other people. These responses are automatic. We're so good at this. Another thing that we're, we're pretty good at or we get good at is taking other people's perspectives. Taking other people's perspectives is incredibly important for teaching and learning. Right? Um, in developmental psychology, they call that theory of mind. Theory of mind is understanding someone else's mind, someone else's psychological interior. You can peer into their experience and know it just as well as your own experience. You almost have to put aside your own experience to do that, right? In a discussion, that's really important in a seminar. You have to put aside what you think sometimes in order to really hear and really understand what, what someone else thinks. Well, it turns out, um, if you can do that, Better, if you have a better theory of mind, um, well, for one thing, you'll be a, a better teacher. Even three to five-year-olds, when they're teaching someone else, the three to five-year-olds that are really good at understanding other people's minds are the best teachers because you have to know where someone else is coming from to teach them something, right? But also the best learners because, um, you know, we can, you can fill in the gaps of someone else's understanding. If someone else is listening to you, you can let them know where you're coming from because you know where they're coming from. This was an interesting study where they had people drawing, draw the letter E on their forehead. And they just asked them simply to, to um, you know, draw an E. You ask them, draw an E on your foreheads. Half the people draw an E the way I would see it, as I'm asking you. And half the people draw the E the way they would see it. Well, it turns out that the people who draw the E on the forehead the way others can see it, are much better at theory of mind and perspective taking. That shouldn't be a surprise, but the, the surprise is that people that had more power were less good at this task. People with a lot of power are less good at seeing other people's perspectives. <laughs> so when you can be on the ground and knowing yourself and understanding others' perspectives, then that gives you the social cachet to accomplish anything. And it's really important for, for learning. Collaboration is another way that we learn. And we know now from the brain that there are neurons called mirror neurons, that when you see somebody about to do something with the intention of doing it yourself, your brain responds as if you were doing it. Let me explain that a little more carefully. This was first discovered in monkeys. 
So what they did was they had one monkey about to eat a banana, and the other monkey was really hungry, sitting right next to that other one and watching him peel the banana, take a bite of the banana, and as they're doing that, they're looking at their brains. And what they're finding is there are neurons in your brain that if you intently watch the other guy eating that banana, to your brain, it's no different than doing it yourself. That's a fast track way to learn because you are actually, in a sense, becoming the other person to your brain. So if you're carefully, if you're right there with me and I'm sharing my ideas, there's no difference between my ideas and your ideas when we're talking together collaboratively. That way we can create a collaborative mind. We can understand things we could never understand by working together. And there's all kinds of research that supports that um, in children. When children work together on tasks, they tend to forget who did what. They tend to overinflate their, their contribution. So in some of these studies, they have them build these complex things. So let's say we had you building a spaceship out of Legos. And we had you working together and coming up with an innovative idea to use every piece, and you have to create the spaceship. And then we come in and ask you, whose idea was it to put the door on the top? Or how did you decide to make this pointy? And then the kids will say, well, I, I did that. That was my idea. They'll take credit for everything. They'll take credit for all the ideas. And the reason that they'll do that is because to them, there, there is a blur between themselves and the other person. They become one as they're creating that. And the kids who do the most um, taking credit for everything are the best at doing the, the thing later. So you, the kids who think they did the whole rocket ship, even though they work with five people, Ask them to build a rocket ship by themselves, and they'll be the best one at doing that. So there's something to that collaborative thinking and, and working together, which is why we're asking you here in college to work together and to share your thinking and to share your ideas, because collaboration catapults learning. Now, this is something that was done at Stanford by Philip Zimbardo, who's a famous um, psychologist. And what he does now in his intro psychology classes, I think he's still teaching them, as of a few years ago he was, um, he has all exams taken collaboratively. You never take an exam in intro psych by yourself, you take an exam with a partner every time. And the reason that Zimbardo does this is because he found, through his experimentation, that the, the students who take exams together do better on the exams and they also retain more later when asked about the concepts of psychology. They also reported a significant um, reduction in test anxiety. And for people who said the most stressful thing in college is exams, we all know now that stress downshifts you out of this prefrontal cortex into the amygdala, into fight or flight. If you have a, are having a panic attack during an exam, it's never going to be a reflection of, of the knowledge that you've taken in from this course. So the reason that the idea that we have to be in competition with one another has no bearing on learning and growth and development. In fact, most of learning just like learning language happens socially, happens in groups, and happens together. So, so people who understand this have, have realized that what's the point? What's the point of, of taking exams alone? More pain, more gain, less pain when students share information and grades. So I want to put I want to pose some questions um, for discussion that have something to do with some of these ideas, and maybe we can start some people. Um, <coughs> here, and then we can talk, pick it up later in the, in the round table. First, your body and brain are constantly changing and growing to the point of constituting a, com constituting a completely different you after a number of weeks, months, or years. Does knowing this change your feeling of a stable identity? How much of you is your physical self? The second one is, can curiosity be taught, or must genuine wonder come from within? And then describe a struggle or a mistake of your own, which was integral to the formation of, of your current identity. Something that happened to you, some kind of struggle or some kind of mistake that you made that, that was really important for who you are. And should formal schooling encourage more risk taking and mistake making for learning? And what would that look like um, in a classroom? And what would that look like in, in terms of your identity? So does anybody want to respond? Does anyone want to share something that in terms of their, maybe we should start with the mistakes. Does anyone want to share a, a mistake that taught them something or changed the way they look at life? Or, yes? Uh, so I put on my application to uh, all my schools. Uh, I didn't realize that it was already like a sociology. Uh, I was going to put business. <laughs> um, so it was like pretty selected. I messed up on one of them and it did it for all of them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
That's great. That's great. Any other mistakes that have, that have happened that have taught you something or that you've learned from or that have changed you in fundamental ways? Something you're not too embarrassed to tell the group about? What is it about mistakes that makes us feel that they're, they're ruining us? It's just like being a fool. Like Thank you very much.